Let's bring in more for uh, China M&A, shall we? And we get the latest from Nicholas Pache, who's the uh, vice president at GIA Group. He's uh, a vice president for China for the company. Okay, Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us today. So energy assets are still dominating uh, China's M&A activities, really accounting for about 65% of the total value of a deal since 2003. What about uh, the hunt for Brazilian energy assets? Good morning, Susan. It's great to be here. Yeah, the, the Brazilian energy story is an incredibly compelling one. Um, we, uh, what we're seeing actually is that the Brazilian energy market is set to become, uh, by 2020, many analysts are actually expecting uh, Brazil to become one of the top five energy producers globally. Um, and uh, clearly China's appetite for energy is, is immense and, and this uh, creates a wonderful opportunity and a great pairing for these two, for these two countries. Um, if, if, if Brazil is really going to uh, become a top five energy producer globally by 2020, they're actually going to require about $400 billion uh, of capital uh, mm -hmm. to develop the infrastructure, drilling, exploration, et cetera. And about $120 billion of that is actually going to be uh, financed by Petrobras, given all of the uh, commitments that they've been given uh, by the Brazilian government. So there's going to uh -huh. be a huge requirement for capital. And that's where uh, I think the two countries are going to fit very nicely. So we're expecting a okay. huge volume of, of outbound M&A hey. deals into, into Brazil looking at the energy sector. Yeah. Nicholas, let's talk about funding. You brought up capital, right? Where exactly is China coming up with all this cash for their, uh, their spending sprees on M&A? Well, I mean, you know, China is uh, the wealthiest, pretty much the wealthiest country on the planet at the moment. I mean, we're looking at reserves of $2.4 trillion in the hands of the government. Uh, and the reality is that still today, most industries and energy very much included uh, are controlled by the government. Um, so the reality is that this, this series of very large energy companies in China are going to be backed by the government as needed. They have access to plenty of capital in the markets here, which they can raise through secondary offerings and debt issues as needed. But mm -hmm. capital is really not going to be the issue or the challenge um, in this case. Okay, well, I'll tell you what some of the challenges have been, Nicholas, because some of these deals haven't really paid off. I mean, if you look at CIC buying into Blackstone, Morgan Stanley, and uh, mm. some of their bids uh, for U.S. assets have failed because of, some would say, government protectionism. Definitely. And, you know, that's that's one of the very interesting things. Uh, you know, the 20 largest deals that China has done in, 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 in all of its history, 25 percent of those have actually happened in 2009. Uh, so the deals are becoming increasingly large, increasingly controversial, and we're seeing more and more protectionism. I think in the case of energy and Brazil, uh, my, our view is that we're really not going to see that much protectionism. Uh, the reality is that with these massive new oil field finds, uh, the subsalt oil, uh, offshore oil find, oil, oil reserve finds uh, off the coast of Brazil, Brazil will require massive external investment to cultivate those oil fields. So mm -hmm. I, do, we, you know, I really don't think that protectionism is going to be a major challenge in this case. Okay, Nicholas, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Nicholas Bechet of GIA. That does it.